and we can dive right in. So hello everyone and welcome to the Ocean County Historical Society's temporarily virtual speaker series. We usually host these at our museum, but due to the pandemic, we are now online. Thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Melissa Ziobro and I am a trustee of the Historical Society. I am hosting these online talks on behalf of our president, Mr. Brian Bavasso, who usually does such a wonderful job when we are in person. So thank you, Brian, for all the work you do on the society's behalf. I'd also like to thank some other trustees who made today's event possible, Barbara Roish and Richard and Mickey Kunz. Now I have just a few housekeeping announcements I have been asked to make before we dive into today's program. Today's speaker series, like so many of our events, is free, but we do rely on your donations to keep us going and to continue our mission telling the stories of Ocean County. We'd like you to know that you can donate from the safety and convenience of your own home via our website, oceancountyhistory.org. You can also sign up to be a member there. Perks include our award-winning newsletter, early registration and discounts on some programs and more. It's all outlined on our beautiful website. Please know that we are currently open on Tuesdays and Wednesdays from one to four by appointment only. The appointments can be made by emailing oceancounty.history at verizon.net. That information is on our website too. I'd also like to remind everyone that we are on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, thanks to some Monmouth University interns. Please follow us on the platform of your choice or on all. Uh, speaking of YouTube, please know that today's program is being recorded for use on our YouTube channel. And our next lecture is actually next week already when we will welcome Congressman Andy Kim, who is scheduled to present a program on American policy in the Middle East and his experiences there. Okay, last announcement, I promise, before we get to the big show, the Ocean County Historical Society's 34th Annual Antique Crafts and Collectibles Fair has moved to a new location and date. It will be held in the Toms River South Cafetorium off of Hooper Ave on Saturday, May 15th and Sunday, May 16th. So please save those dates and then check our website for additional information. I feel like I'm in class. Does anyone have any questions before I proceed? <laughs> <laughs> okay, then on to today's event. Today's talk is titled Travel Vicariously with the Ocean County Historical Society. It is presented by our own vice president, Dr. Jeffrey Schenker, a lifelong educator, and his longtime friend and fellow traveler, George O'Donnell. They're going to talk to us about their 12-year odyssey visiting presidential sites, and it's particularly timely since none of us can actually travel right now. So <laughs> with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Schenker and George. Melissa, thank you for that wonderful, exceptional introduction. Uh, George and I would also like to sincerely thank Barbara Roish for the invitation, along with Mickey Kuntz and uh, Richard Kuntz. So thank you all very much. And of course, also thank, thank the support of our president, uh, Brian Bavasso. So here's what we're going to do today. Um, George and I did a trial run, and <laughs> it's tough to cover 30 presidents. So what we've done is we've cut it down to 10. We're gonna show all the houses we've been to, but we're gonna focus primarily on 10 of the presidents. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of it, we'll be glad to answer any questions. In fact, George and I always exchange our uh, Christmas gifts. This year, I got him a new book entitled, and this is true, The Sex Life of American Presidents. So if you have any questions about that at the end, it's an area of expertise. Or Barb, you might want to ask him to do a PowerPoint presentation related to that. You probably get a lot of people signing up. Um, let me tell you the genesis of how this started. George and I have been friends, best of friends, for 42 years now. We go back to college, and um, we're very, very close. We consider each other family. We were driving the car one day talking about ruminating how we're getting older and we had a bucket list and we talked about some things we'd like to accomplish so um to do in our life so i happen to mention to george one of my goals would be to visit every presidential library or birthplace but i'll never ever find somebody who'd go with me so george right away says jeff i'd love to do that 
I go home to my wife and I say, uh, Michelle, would you mind if George O'Donnell and a, possibly a couple of our other college friends go away for a couple days on a little mini vacation? And it was a horrific time to ask. Our daughter, Abby, was just born. And her response was, I've heard numerous college stories about you guys. Um, if you think I'm going to get let you go to Bermuda or Vegas together, you have another thing coming. So my response was, first of all, we're not in college anymore. Second of all, we don't want to go to Ver uh, Vegas or Bermuda. So she's like, well, where do you want to go? And I said, obviously, Springfield, Illinois. Her response was, what the heck can you do in Springfield, Illinois? And um, my response was, obviously, it's the land of Lincoln. So we're going to start off with our first visit along our odyssey uh, that's taken us from California to Vermont, to New Hampshire, to Virginia, eventually out to Iowa. Uh, we're going to start with the first presidential site we visited. And George, that's yours. Okay. All right, I'm going to, there we go. Uh, hey, thanks, Jeff. And thanks for the invite. We really appreciate it. it uh, we, I think our families are sick of hearing about it from us. So uh, so we, we'd love to uh, show it to other, other people. Uh, I want to echo something Jeffrey said that uh, one of the things that uh, uh, this has been an adventure of my life uh, and it's still not over obviously, but uh, and to be able to share it with, uh, with a good friend is, has just been extra special. So, and uh, we love to share it with, with all of you. Uh, the, the, the first place we decided to go to, because we both uh, really uh, enjoy reading about and uh, about Abe Lincoln, uh, was Springfield. But right outside of Springfield is uh, is New Salem. Uh, it's basically the village where uh, where Lincoln kind of started. Uh, you know, he was a clerk. He was uh, a surveyor out there and a postmaster. Uh, there is, there's a little village that's right on the site where, where uh, the original New Salem was. And, um, and there is one, actually one building that's still standing, which is the Cooper shop. Uh, but I would recommend that you, you go out there and visit bef uh, before you start your, uh, your, spring, your Springfield uh, uh, education. But in Springfield, one of the things that I enjoy is places uh, that we've gone where you really get the feel for that particular president. And there's no place else like Springfield as far as that goes. There's so many things uh, and places where Lincoln uh, spent time. One in particular is uh, the Lincoln Herndon office, uh, Law Office, which you can go upstairs and, and, uh, and, and, and see where he spent time. Uh, also there uh, to the right there is the uh, uh, state, the old state house, Illinois state house. Uh, that's where he was in the legislature. Uh, also of note, uh, that's where uh, Barack Obama uh, announced his candidacy uh, for the presidency in 2008. But the main thing, uh, one of the main things there is the museum. The museum is absolutely fabulous. Uh, lots of things to lots of things to see. It's it's almost a hundred thousand square feet of museum. Uh, so when you go, make sure you leave leave enough time. Uh, you see, uh, they they have a, a, a facsimile of the White House and uh, and the and the Lincoln family there that you can stand and take a picture with. And so uh, it takes a, takes a while to get through the museum, like I said, but there's some really fabulous uh, uh, artifacts. One in particular, they have uh, Lincoln's, uh, one of his original uh, stovepipe hats still has his finger, uh, his, his uh, finger uh, touch right on, the, uh, uh, on it and uh, pretty interesting stuff. But probably one of the, uh, the most amazing things to me was that the uh, they saved a four block by four block area of Springfield where the Lincoln home is, which is the picture to your left there. And uh, so all some of the original homes that were there when he was there, uh, you can go into his his home, uh, into virtually every room. It, it's just it gives you such a feel for the president. It's really uh, quite amazing. George, can I point something out? Sure. 
uh, that is actually the only house that Abe Lincoln owned uh, in his life. And you could see it's a fairly large house. You know, we have this um, conception of Lincoln as being this poor rail splitter. Well, the brilliant genius of Lincoln is with about a six month formal education, he became one of the most prominent railroad lawyers in Illinois. Um, so uh, he actually was quite wealthy by this time. Go ahead, George. I'm sorry. Yeah, actually, that and that that house was originally a, a single story. He he actually not only put a second story in, but if you look in the back, he put another uh, 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 another section onto the house. So he added as his family got bigger. Uh, still standing also is the uh, the Great Western uh, Railroad Station. Uh, this is where Lincoln actually left uh, uh, left Springfield for the last time. Uh, uh, after he was elected president, on his way on his way to Washington, and you can go into there in, into the uh, uh, train station there. Uh, to the right is uh, rush hour at uh, in Springfield. Uh, <laughs> it's actually uh, this is actually I think a Saturday uh, a Saturday morning. Uh, the the town is a uh, is obviously the state capital, so but everybody leaves. And at five o'clock, it, it is pretty empty. I'm literally standing in the middle of the road there and I could have stood there for probably an hour and not uh, had anything go by me. So uh, another place to, to, to visit uh, is the uh, Oak Ridge Cemetery, which is where uh, Abe's, uh, uh, Abe is buried. Uh, you see the uh, right behind us uh, in the left-hand picture. There is the mausoleum. Uh, you see the you see the nose that's just kind of shiny. That everybody is supposed to to touch the nose for luck, and uh, so uh, we we did while we were there. But to the right is the is the mausoleum. Uh, actually, uh, Abe is buried. Uh, I think about thirty feet under about thirty feet of yeah, concrete, yeah. Mm -hmm. basically because at one point, uh, right after he was buried, which is right into into this uh, into uh, to to the left there, uh, he was originally buried in that uh, in, in that mausoleum. Uh, they, there was a, an attempt to steal his body after he was after he was dead and hold it for ransom. Uh, and so they, after that happened, they decided to uh, make it impossible for anybody to uh, to steal that. Uh, just to point out some other things that are uh, that are around there, uh, and uh, Jeff and I tend to go onto some un a little unusual things. So we did find while we were there uh, Roy Bertelli, who is called Mr. Accordion. Uh, for the life, his lifetime dedication uh, to the accordion. Uh, we also found Jeff was dying to see the Museum of Funeral Customs, but unfortunately it was closed at the time. So he was, you could see he was very sad, uh, sad about that. And not to disappoint anybody, if you go to Springfield and you want to visit the Museum of Funeral Customs, unbelievably they're out of business. They've <laughs> shut down. Go ahead, George. Yeah, and uh, we also we were we we're uh, earlier uh, amongst ourselves we were talking about food. Uh, Jeffrey and I, uh, uh, we we do tend to love food. Buffets are seem to be our favorite. But at on the on the way outside of Springfield, you can stop at the home of the famous hot dog on a stick. So if you decide that you're hungry while you're in Springfield, don't forget to stop there. And George, wasn't that on the old Route 66, which was pretty cool? That was on uh, Route 6, uh, 66, that's yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, one, of the, one of the neater trips that we took was uh, down uh, through Virginia. Uh, one of the stops was uh, at uh, Washington's Mount Vernon. Uh, I'm sure many of you have been there, but it, it really has changed over time. Uh, they've added a, a, a wonderful museum. Uh, you can, uh, they have been doing some renovation, but uh, you can go into the house and see all the various rooms. Uh, the, and so, some of them are decorated uh, kind of uniquely in, in different colors. It's really interesting. Uh, but the view out front, this is where Jeff is right by the Potomac there. That's the view, just, a, just incredibly, uh, incredibly gorgeous. 
but it's about 500 acres of, of, of farm. Uh, there's stables and gardens. There's a, a, a uh, he actually has a distillery uh, not too far from the location that you can see, uh, but really well worth it. Uh, like I said, the museum is, is really top notch. And uh, uh, I believe one of the things that they have there uh, he, is his, uh, is, are his uh, teeth. They have, have that under glass. Uh, so uh, if you want to see his teeth, you can certainly do that. And then the mausoleum where uh, both he and Martha are buried. Okay, Jeffrey. Yeah, you know, I just wanted to say one thing about Mount Vernon. I think we all know that George Washington uh, could have served more than two terms as president. There was nothing in the Constitution pertaining to that till after Franklin Roosevelt's presidency. But he was sick of the presidency because he, uh, with the Constitution, there was nothing about uh, opposing political parties developing, and he was totally against it. He just couldn't wait to get home to his beloved Mount Vernon. He himself picking that spot, thinking it was the most beautiful spot in Virginia, and he modeled himself after a famous Roman general named Cincinnati, who also, after he led Rome, wanted to retire to civilian life. So that was George Washington's model. Now, George, we're ready. So you go to Mount Vernon, it's packed. There's long lines. Now, this is our trip to Virginia. We're not in chronological order. It was actually based on geographic precedence. So then we arrive at John T Tyler's Sherwood Forest. John Tyler replaced William Henry Harrison, who died in office. Some people felt he should have resigned. They were calling him his accidental president, that sort of thing. So compare this to Mount Vernon. We pull up. There is not a single car there. And this is a true story. There's an old deteriorated gate with a wooden sign that looked like it was going to fall off saying, please give a $10 donation. So we give the $10, we drive in, and it was bizarre. We're the only people on the ground, on the grounds. Then we find out you can make a phone call, call the house. Now, William, I'm sorry, John Tyler is president in 1830s. His grandson, he had, Tyler had children in his 70s. By the way, he was the most prolific president in that regard. He had 14 children with two wives. His grandson was still living in the house. He just died last year. Uh, that, and the house was very bizarre because parts of it were added on in the 60s, the 70s, et cetera. It's actually the longest frame house in the United States. It was 348 feet long. Think about that. That's the size that's larger than a football field. But the bizarre thing, whoever was the architect, it's 348 feet long and 24 feet deep. And it has a 68 foot uh, foot ballroom. So, you, you know, we kind of like the obscure things and we found this very, very interesting. And we had the grounds, there's no wait online. We had the grounds totally to ourselves. Did Jeffrey, did you say that uh, uh, his grandson just died last like November or uh, October? Yeah, and that, that was what we went to the only privately owned uh, a state or a house from a family. That was kind of interesting. Right. I don't know what's going to happen to now. Okay, next one. Uh, then literally right down the road uh, from Tyler's uh, house was William Henry Harrison's. Uh, uh, this is his uh, uh, where he was born. Uh, his father actually built the, the house, uh, Benjamin Harrison, who was actually a uh, uh, signer of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and uh, it was uh, quite a site. Uh, it was actually a bivouac area for the Union troops during uh, the Civil War. They actually still have a cannonball uh, in uh, the on the building in the in the right there. There's still a cannonball cannonball in the uh, uh, in the building itself. And uh, interestingly, they take uh, uh, this location uh, takes credit for the very first Thanksgiving. Uh, back in in that case, it was December of uh, 1619, and they uh, try to predate it from uh, any other Thanksgiving uh, such as Plymouth. Yeah. Go ahead, Jeff. And it's it's actually on the James River, if I remember right, right George. It is yes. Okay, here's a must see. Um, even if you're not into history, the architect is amazing. Architecture of it is amazing. Uh, Monticello. 
um, is about uh, two hours south of Washington. Um, and it's one hour north of Richmond. And Richmond is a wonderful city to visit. Uh, home of, uh, you have Jefferson Davis, you know, capital of the Confederacy. Uh, his White House there, a Civil War Museum. Charlottesville's a great college town. Um, Jefferson was an architect for the University of Virginia, and that was one of his most proudest things. The dorms he designed are still there. And downtown Charlottesville, they close off only, um, only allows pedestrian traffic for about a six block area. But if you look at this house, let me say one thing before that. John F. Kennedy uh, was holding a um, conference for Nobel Prize uh, laureates, Nobel Prize winners. And he said the following, this might be the most intelligent group of people ever assembled in the White House, um, except when Thomas Jefferson died, dined alone. And you really see that in Monticello, which it took him 20 years to build. Interestingly, if you look at the house, it looks like it's one floor. And I'm, I'm no expert at all in architecture, but it's actually two, it's actually two stories. Um, you walk in there and uh, the first thing you see in the hallway is he has all these mounted stuffed animals uh, and they came from the Lewis and Clark expedition. In fact, Meriwether Lewis was his private secretary. Then you start walking in and one of his inventions, you know, besides being a politician, philosopher, et cetera, botanist, uh, was he was an inventor. Uh, and they had this double door there that you could step on something that he designed both doors open. Then they show you, I've never seen anything like this before, a two-faced clock, which you can see from the inside of uh, the mansion and from the outside. He also had the earliest, he invented the earliest copying machine. Um, if you walk the grounds, one of the things I found most interesting, I was there many years ago, and it was almost like they wanted to erase any um, idea of that he was a slaveholder. Well, now they've evolved with that, and uh, they showed the slave quarters, slave cemetery, and I always found Jefferson interesting. I find him to be kind of a dichotomy. On one hand, he strongly believed in the yeoman individual farmer. He was, uh, as opposed to Alexander Hamilton, opposed to uh, large-scale industry. Of course, he wrote the Declaration of Independence, but he had a large amount of slaves, and he took young boys eight from eight years old up, and in essence, he established a nail factory to maintain uh, the estate. He was he was always uh, indebted, land rich, slave rich, but um, he was about $100,000 in debt when he died. In fact, he sold his book collection for $25,000 to establish the Library of Congress. If you look at the monument uh, for him, where he is buried, you see what he was most proud of, and that's the Virginia Resolves, uh, which a lot of that relates to the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the Louisiana Purchase, and most of all, being the architect for the University of Virginia. Okay, George. And then uh, really very close, in fact, uh, 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 James and Rose Highland property actually butts up right up against uh, Jefferson's property. So he's that, uh, he's that close, but, uh, 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 James, Monroe, James Monroe's Highland is uh, is right nearby. You can see the main house, uh, some some of the slave quarters. Uh, it is while while you're at uh, at uh, Mont Monticello, it's worth uh, taking the drive drive out to Monroe's and seeing uh, where he lived. I think one of the things George and I both agree with is one of the things we like most is seeing. We love some museums, but the birthplaces of presidents and their homes give you an idea of how they form their ideologies and how they live their life. Yeah. There's a common trivia question, what president was born in New Jersey? And you guys probably all know the answer to this, but many people say Woodrow Wilson. He wasn't. Woods, Wilson was born in Staunton, Virginia, then became president of Princeton University and then governor of New Jersey. The only president born in New Jersey was Grover Cleveland, and uh, his father was a Presbyterian minister. If you want, if you want to go for a nice drive, and it's a very nice, quaint community, the house is standing in Caldwell, New Jersey. There's docents there. Uh, we had our own private tour. You probably spend an hour there. There's our lovely docent. 
Um, there's a little museum in there. Um, I bought my Grover Cleveland bobblehead. Okay, and um, interesting thing about him, um, he was our only two term non consecutive president. In fact, in between him was Benjamin Harrison, the grandson of William Henry Harrison. The other thing I found fascinating, well, he moved to uh, Buffalo, New York with his family at a young age. He became mayor of Buffalo, then governor, and uh, he was the first president to get married in the White House. He was 47, 48 years old. He married his best friend's daughter, who was 21 years old. So we found that kind of interesting. George? Okay, if you want to spend a nice vacation, go up to Hyde Park along the Hudson. So on this tour, we did F. FDR, we did Teddy Roosevelt in uh, Long Island, and we did Martin Van Buren. And his home, we thought, ah, I'd be all right. It was actually very interesting. You got a good feel for uh, his growing up. His native language was actually Dutch. And we were very, it was very fortuitous. When we visited the house, they were renovating it and they were peeling off uh, wallpaper. And they actually found, we found this very fascinating, the original wallpaper. It was done in a French design. Uh, and it was in pristine condition of a uh, of a fox hunt. Okay. So, and by the way, the other thing about him, many of you might know this. His nickname was Old Kinderhook from Kinderhook, New York. So he was signed his documents. Okay. And it's believed that uh, that's where that um, that started. The idea of okay. Um, George, I told you not to take pictures of me when I'm very heavy, but okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's all right. I'll let you go. Next one. And and just yes. uh, just to point one thing, this the reason why that we have this picture of the uh, road there. This is one of the only uh, pieces of the old post road, which went from Boston down to Philadelphia. This is one of the only pieces of the, of the old post road that's actually not uh, that's still kind of gravel is not paved. And uh, I, I don't know. I thought that was pretty fascinating. Yeah. Here's a must-see, Hyde Park along the Hudson River. The Roosevelt's, as you know, was a prominent, wealthy family. Uh, when Franklin married Eleanor, they moved into this home with uh, Eleanor's mother-in-law. Apparently, they had a horrific relationship. Um, the grounds are beautiful. Uh, there's a wonderful library there that Roosevelt felt should be left for the public. And he was actually involved in the arrangement of the house and museum. It gave you a true feel for the life of Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, you could just feel and sense his being there. For instance, on one of the desks, he was, he was a very avid stamp collector and you could see his stamp collection. And he was also um, under secretary of the Navy at one point and he was very interested in nautical things. So there's all sorts of ships, uh, that sort of thing. And uh, when you visit there, Eleanor liked her time away from Franklin, that's all other story, but there's Eleanor's cottage where she spent a good amount of time in close proximity. You could have a wonderful lunch or dinner at the CIA, uh, the Culinary Institute of America. West Point is only an hour away. And if you've never been there, I strongly suggest you go there when the cadets are in session and they have a great military museum. Um, also right in the Hyde Park area by the Hudson, there's a Vanderbilt estate to visit. So I think you can spend a good two, three days there. It's just a wonderful, wonderful drive. George, about three hours from Tom's River. George. Right. Uh, and then from there, we actually we headed down to uh, uh, we headed down to uh, Oyster Bay, New York, which is where Teddy Roosevelt's Sagamore Hill home uh, is located. Uh, another one of these places where you go into the house and it's almost like he just left. Every he has there's so much there is so much of his life in uh, in the rooms that are there. It's just incredible uh, from, you know, t from his uh, many adventures out west to uh, going on safari. Uh, there's there's so many there's so many artifacts. You can't even you, you almost need to go a couple of times just to just to make sure you catch you, you, you uh, catch everything. Uh, but great tours of the house. Uh, I, I would uh, right now uh, right now they have uh, I believe it just opened up. Uh, there's a brand new museum 
which has uh, been placed, uh, built right next to uh, the, the house itself. Uh, and I hear it's fantastic. So if uh, uh, I'd like to actually go back, yeah. Uh, but if you get a chance, it's really, it's really worth, uh, it's really worth your time and effort to go out to Oyster Bay and take a look, take a look at uh, Teddy's house. If you like reading biographies, which I do, I always find Teddy Roosevelt one of the most interesting people imaginable. Uh, he died in his late 50s, early 60s. But if you read about him, it was like he led ten, li 10 lives. I'll just give you one example. Literally, his mother and his wife died on the same day, on the same year. And he says, the heck with this, I got to get away. And that's when he goes out west, and here you have, here you have this patrician New Yorker hanging around with these rough, rugged um, cowboys. Okay, um, and by the way, Oyster Bay is a really, really upscale, nice town. Great restaurants and things of that nature. Hey, George. Okay, uh, it's it's almost uh, for us. It's almost a, a, an embarrassment of riches as far as all these these great trips that we've been able to go on. Uh, going up to the Boston area and right outside of Boston is uh, Quincy, and that's where the uh, uh, the Adams. Uh, I, I was, I was going to say the Adams family, but uh, the the John Adams family uh, uh, lived. Uh, the house on the left is actually the house that uh, that John was born in. Uh, the house on the right, uh, right, actually right on the road there, that's the house that uh, 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 that John Quincy was born in. Subsequently, uh, the uh, what they what uh, John called Peacefield uh, was built. And uh, uh, about four generations of Adams uh, ha uh, lived in this house. Uh, another place where you go in and you and there's a lot of the original furniture, uh, paintings on the walls, and you get to go in and see the dining room and go in to see uh, John's study. Uh, and some of the uh, it just gives you such a feel of them just being you know either John or John Quincy just being there, just. It really is incredible. Uh, they do. Uh, it's a national park, uh, and they do. They call the they call Peacefield the old house. Uh, some great, some beautiful gardens you can walk around in. Uh, one of the fascinating things I think to Jeff and I was uh, they uh, uh, in uh, 1870 there was built to house. They had uh, the Adams had 12,000 volumes of books. Uh, that they had, they had collected over time, and uh, so they built this beautiful library, uh, stone library, uh, 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 right next to Peacefield that you can go in and take a look at this, and it's just, it's, it really is incredible. Did you have anything else on Adam? Yeah, I just want to say two things. And by the way, you know, everybody, if you've never taken your family or grandkids or whoever up to Boston, Boston's a phenomenal historic city. And um, Quincy is a suburb of Boston. It's right on the way. Actually, when Adams was president, it was Braintree and uh, uh, eventually changed his name. Interesting thing about John Quincy Adams, he's the only president in American history and after his presidency, he was elected to the House of Representatives at age 63, and he became a leading abolitionist during that time period. Um, he had a major stroke on the floor of the House of Representatives. They took him out of there, and he subsequently died within a couple of days. It's a remarkable story. George, go ahead. JFK. Okay. And then, uh, literally within minutes of uh, uh, where where uh, Peacefield was, you have the John F. Kennedy uh, 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 Library and Museum. Uh, really, a fabulous place. Uh, it was built. Uh, the architect for it was I. M. Pei. Uh, just 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 the architecture itself is really uh, worth going to see. But uh, within the confines, uh, there's some great exhibits. They start you out with a a uh, really poignant uh, movie that kind of gets you in the mood. Then you go into the museum itself uh, and uh, goes through uh, 
you know, uh, goes through his early life. Uh, and a lot of it is done uh, uh, through the, uh, as, especially on the politics side, is done through the medium of television. Uh, so you get to kind of see what was actually having, happening at the time. Uh, and then it goes all the way up to uh, obviously his, his assassination. But it's really, a, it's, it's a, a beautiful building. Uh, uh, there's some uh, uh, great exhibits he, uh, right outside. In fact, I would recommend going out and taking a look. Uh, you have the Vic, uh, uh, the Victura, which is what, which was actually his sailing boat, and they have that they have that right out front. Uh, I would uh, um, the other th couple of things I would do. Uh, they they have built right next to the JFK Library is the Edward Kennedy uh, Senate Museum. And I have not been to it, but I hear it's uh, it's pretty neat and uh, probably worth the trip while you're visiting uh, the JFK Library. And then uh, alternate to that um, is um, if you're in if you're going to stay in Boston for a little bit, go out to Brookline uh, and the the home the, they actually have the place where the home that uh, JFK was born. Uh, in Brookline, and uh, that is open to tours also, and and, and is worth and is worth the trip. You know, one of the things, George, that I really found interesting there, the major by far emphasis was on the life of Kennedy. There was very very little about the assassination, which I thought was a very decent way to present it. Okay, right. so we're on this New England trip. And we'll go through some of these kind of quick. Uh, we drove up to Plymouth Knox, New Hampshire, visited uh, the family farm of Calvin College, which got a real good feeling for Cal, who replaced Warren G. Harding when Harding died in office. There's a cheese factory still in operation, a general store, an old hotel. When we got up there, it was a long day and we were traveling for a long time. We were exhausted and we were dehydrated. And we were telling that to our docent. It was just the two of us. And she said, boys, I can help you out. She took us into that general store and she told us she's going to give us Calvin Coolidge's favorite soda. So like, this is great. What was it named, George? Moxie? Moxie. It was the worst gosh darn soda. Um, and we were too embarrassed to spit it out. We didn't want to hurt her feelings. But <laughs> it was, i rather drink castor oil, honest to God. Uh, but um you kind of get an idea then why Calvin was kind of grumpy and taciturn and quiet if he drank that moxie all the time. The one disappointment was we wanted to see Calvin Coolidge, the only president who swore in by his father upon the death of Harden because his father was a justice in that building. And uh, unfortunately, we got to look into it, but it was um, but they were closing down the museum at that time. It, uh, you know, it was, it was very interesting. It was worth the trip. Okay, George. And, and I, yeah, and I, I understand that they use moxie to uh, lubricate the farm, uh, uh, the farm machinery. I so. would be surprised. Okay, I would highly recommend that you do not make a trip to Hillsborough, New Hampshire to go to Franklin Pierce's house to go out of the way there. We spent a wonderful about 20 minutes there. Franklin Pierce was president before Buchanan, and then uh, Lincoln, one of the, considered one of the worst presidents in American history. It's kind of a compromise candidate to hold the nation together. Um, to show you, uh, obviously we had the tour by ourselves, to show how tough it is to get there, we're driving all over. George is doing the driving. I felt terrible for him. And finally, we were going in circles. We arrive in Hillsborough, New Hampshire, and we pull into a gas station. This whole town is like two miles. And we asked the proprietor where the Franklin Pierce Museum is. Well, at home, he had no idea. We go to a convenience store. Young lady, she was like, I didn't even know there was a Franklin so we finally found it. Um, we had about a half hour tour from a young lady who um, I think we knew more about Franklin Pierce than she did. She, she tried very hard. She read off a script. So um, I don't think you could put in a two, three day vacation there. But if you have a solid half hour, it might be worth seeing. OK, George. OK. OK, so uh, we convinced two of our college friends reluctantly to go with us uh, overnight to James Buchanan's house 
Uh, it's in Wheatland. James Buchanan, by some, is considered the worst president in American history. He's famous for saying, he becomes president in 1856. He's famous for saying, uh, the South has no legal right to secede from the Union, but the North has no legal right to prevent them from doing it. So thank God Lincoln comes along. These are our college friends. Uh, his home is in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So, uh, you know, we had to go to good and plenty. Our friend Mac is a very successful business, but both of our friends are very successful. Uh, but uh, Mac, very successful in finance and an entrepreneur. But we found that he wasn't very worldly when we told him that uh, we were going to go to good and plenty or plain and fancy. It was a family style buffet. He said, oh, what do they have like really good Italian food there? He liked the shoe fly pie. He was disappointed, no lasagna. That's a picture of the four of us at Buchanan's house. George's wife came along with us for that particular trip. If, if you're in Lancaster, it's worth seeing. And George has an obsession, truly, about <laughs> taking pictures of privies. Um, and he was very impressed. Apparently, during that era, the amount of privies you had was a status symbol. And Buchanan, I think he had the record for you, George, with five? I, I believe it was five, yes. Yeah, he got a little carried away. He even took a picture of me, which I told him I'll kill him if he ever shows of me walking out of a porta potty on Missouri. So, but I don't know, he has an obsession with this. Go ahead. Okay, uh, James Madison. Um, I was very excited to go to Montpelier, um, James Madison's mansion built by his father. My doctoral dissertation was on James, the political ideology of James Madison. And I actually spent two weeks doing uh, research, reading his, uh, reading his actual letters at the Library of Congress. It wasn't edited at that time. Now the University of Virginia has edited it. Um, when you walk in there, it's like a surreal or visceral effect because you're thinking, if you had to pick 10 people who greatly influenced American history, here you have the father of the Constitution, one of the fathers of the Constitution, uh, certainly the father of the Bill of Rights, president during the War of 1812, and author of the 85 uh, documents that comprise the Federalist Papers, uh, Madison, John Jay, and Alexander Hamilton, which in essence convinces the states to ratify the Constitution. Um, the, the only um, downside to it, and the grounds are beautiful, you can see it's a very large estate, excuse me, estate, is that um, it was privately owned from 1901 to the 1980s by the mm -hmm. DuPont family. So they drastically renovated it. We weren't able to see the, um, we weren't able to see the upstairs at the time, but it was well worth the visit. And little aside, James Madison is the only, um, American president to attend Princeton University and lived in Nassau Hall when it was actually the college called the College of New Jersey. Okay, George. His grounds. Um, from there, um, and we're not going to get into this, but you could travel a little further south, many Civil War battlefields, including the Wilderness Campaign and Fredericksburg and Chancellorville, which were major losses to the Union. Fredericksburg was fascinating. The home of Supreme Court Justice John Jay was there. Hugh Mercer, who Mercer County is named after, um, his, his apothecaries in Fredericksburg, and it's quite a quaint old town. Go ahead, George. Okay. Uh, another, great, uh, another great trip was uh, out to California and uh, we went to see uh, Ronald Reagan's uh, uh, library and museum. Uh, what, a, uh, what a spectacular uh, museum, spectacular location, probably next to, uh, next to uh, Abe Lincoln's museum, probably the, the largest uh, museum that we, we, uh, that we went to. There had to be a lot of money that went into this. Uh, uh, the the different collections of of uh of you know for example in back of us in, in that picture on the right uh it has uh uh, uh, Re uh reagan's air force one is there his limo uh there's a uh, i believe there's a f1 uh f f117 night hawk one of the stealth bombers uh there's an uh f15 uh they have there's so many different things to look at. You really, you really need a whole day to to kind of go 
yeah. to go through it. And it does go through his life. It goes through, um, you know, his acting career on to uh, on to being governor of California and then on to the presidency. Uh, but it's pretty uh, uh, it's pretty. Uh, uh, <laughs> sorry, um, I move it ahead, George. OK, <laughs> But there's the, this is the view. It's on the top of a on the top of a hill, and it overlooks the Simi Valley, and it's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, and both he, uh, uh, both uh, Ron and uh, uh, and uh, his wife are buried uh, at, at this location. Final thing about it, you, you know, uh, we try to tell you about this from our perspective, and both George and I noticed. Nancy Reagan was still alive when the museum was planned out. And interestingly, there's a section of Ronald Reagan's life that was almost totally uh, eviscerated. His uh, marriage to Jane Wyman, uh, her stepchildren. Uh, if you went through that museum, you'd never even know they existed. Thank you, George. So your Belinda, poor Orange Grove community back in the day of Richard Dixon's childhood. It's about an hour from LA. Um, this is his original house built in 1913. You can take tours of it. A lot of the original furniture uh, came from a, a rather poor family and you get that feeling for it. I believe his dad owned a grocery store, but surrounding the original house is a fascinating museum. Okay, and it has a reflecting pool, as you can see, has beautiful grounds, and there is the iconic helicopter when Richard Nixon left the White House in 1974 for the last time. Um, great experience, well worth going to it. Okay. And that's my very best Nixon imitation, so. Believe it or not, we're nerdy, but we're not that nerdy. We'd like to do other fun things. So um, which um, studio is that, George, again? Uh, that's Warner Brothers. Yeah, um, your Linda is only about an hour away from L.A. We, we went to Burbank in L.A., so there's the Warner Brothers. We took the, brothers, we took the tour. We're both big baseball fans. Um, that's Dodger Stadium, which actually it's history themselves. When you go in there, you start thinking of Sandy Koufax and Don Drysdale. It was uh, opened in 1963. It's the third largest stadium uh, still being used in Major League Baseball. Okay, George. Uh, then we uh, we took a Texas swing uh, and uh, visited the George W. Bush uh, uh, Museum down in Dallas, which was interesting. A um, lot of inter interactive uh, uh, interactive areas within the museum. Uh, talked a little, obviously, about 9-11, et cetera. Um, then while you're in Dallas, you really should go uh, uh, down to uh, Dealey Plaza, which is where, obviously, uh, John F. Kennedy was uh, assassinated. You have the, the book depository in the background there. And then actually looking out of the sixth floor window uh, down to the street. And you might be able to see an, an X uh, right about here. Uh, and that's, that's approximately where the car was when, uh, when uh, the, the fatal shot was, uh, was fired. And uh, but it, the museum itself, the six four museum is worth your time uh, if, if you have a chance. It was really surreal because you go out to the famous sniper nest on the sixth floor. Um, all right, George and our friend Joey was with us on this trip too. that created a little problem because our friend Joey and I won't mention any other names is a staunch uh, Republican conservative and somebody on the trip insulted George W. Bush's uh, library. And the two literally did not talk for an entire day, which for me was very awkward driving hundreds of miles through Texas. Okay, um, hmm. Dallas, Texas, that's where the Texas Rangers went. Interestingly, we got there late. George W. Bush was thrown out the first pitch, and it was Derek Jeter's last uh, game at that stadium. Go on, George. Uh, then on to George H.W. Bush's uh, uh, library and museum, which is down in College uh, Station, Texas, which is the home of, uh, of uh, Texas A&M. And uh, what a really uh, beautiful museum, uh, 
uh, so many things about his life. Uh, they did they did really a wonderful job. Uh, he as an aviator during World War II, uh, they have one of the facsimiles of the planes that he flew. Uh, told about his life at Yale and uh, just a just really a wonderful museum. Uh, and uh, if you get a chance to see it, I would I would recommend it. Uh, also in uh, downtown College Station, obviously it's a college town. We did find the uh, this the street in uh, uh, the street in uh, in uh, College Station covered in beer bottle caps. Uh, so you can imagine what uh, the, uh, the those those doggone college kids are up to. So we of course followed that trail, which took us to the back of a huge bar, outdoor bar, <laughs> and there was hundreds of college kids formed in a circle, and we were very we were like. 40 years older than anybody there. But we asked them, what's going on? Why are you all in this uh, circle? And we saw the most interesting sporting event. Uh, one night a week, they had races, but it, it wasn't horses, it wasn't dogs, it was turtle races. So I'm talking to some of these college kids and they tell me, we come here all the time, we have a tip for you. Turtle number seven always wins. So I'm like, this is great. So I go, guys, I'm gonna buy you all drinks. I go running to Joey and George and I say, I have a guaranteed winner. We pull our money and we bet on turtle number seven. And remember how turtle number seven performed, George? I don't think he moved. He didn't come out of his shell. <laughs> we got taken, yeah. Okay, next one. LBJ uh, Library located in Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas is a great college town, extremely liberal. Um, not that that matters, but um, it's actually, as, as a couple of years ago, had the highest literacy rate in the uh, country. And right on um, the University of Texas is the LBJ Library and Museum. Uh, a lot of it had to do you know, with his early life, his political campaigns, a lot of political memorabilia with we both enjoy, uh, mock-up of the White House, um, his limo, it, it was kind of antiquated, like they had a life-size mannequin or whatever you want to call it of LBJ sitting on a corral and it would talk and move. It looked like something out of the 1950s, but it was, it was worth going to, it, uh, great memorabilia there. Now we're going to get to one of the highlights, okay? Remember we said we love going to the homes of these presidents. So we drove to, uh, not a long ride, about an hour out of uh, Austin, we drove to Stonewall, Texas, which um, right there is the birthplace, Johnson City, of uh, Lyndon Johnson. And you could see the schoolhouse he attended, one room schoolhouse. By the way, he started his career as an elementary school teacher. You could see a replica of his original house. But this ranch here, uh, I've been there before, but I couldn't get in there because Lady Bird Johnson was still alive. So now we took a tour of it. And um, one of the more interesting things was we're online. There's probably a group of about 10 or 12 of us. And there's this man behind us. And he kept saying, I remember that couch. I turned on that television. Uh, oh, yeah, I sat in his kitchen. And we're looking at each other like, what's this man talking about? So finally, we turned around and asked him. His mother was the cook and the domestic for Lyndon Johnson. And this man is an uh, African-American, and there's a reason I'm pointing this out. Here you have uh, Johnson growing up in the uh, segregated South. He gave this young man his first car. So we thought that was fascinating. Um, then we go to the gift store, and one of my nerdy habits is I collect presidential busts. I did not have a Lyndon Johnson one. But in the gift store, they had a gigantic one. It was like $280 and I could never fit it home. So the lady was very impressed that we traveled all the way from New Jersey to get there. And she goes, I think I could help you. So she takes me into this small closet. And in that closet, she says, when Lyndon Johnson was president, he liked giving souvenirs to any visitors. And he would give them either a tie clip, believe it or not, an electric toothbrush with the White House logo, or a Lyndon Johnson uh, bust. So she goes, which one would you like? Now, <laughs> the bust was still in the 1964 box. He died before he gave them out. So I'm like, ma'am, how much would that be? And I'm thinking, my God, you know, it's going to be hundreds of dollars. She goes, well, we don't really ever sell them, but you could have it for $40. 
So I got my Lyndon Johnson bus. I still have the 1964 uh, box it came in. His ranch is phenomenally interesting. They built a special runway to get planes in there. He loved driving around his ranch and scaring the heck out of people. Apparently in the early 60s, a hot trend was a, um, what'd you call that, George? Goes uh, amphibious car. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He had an amphibious car that he thought was so cool. And he, he would uh, drive the car and then pretend his brake fail, and he would drive it right into the river. Um, and um, that is very, very close to San Antonio, Texas, which you've never been there. You can easily spend a couple of days there. You have the river walk, nice music, restaurants. You can take cruises there. Of course, the Alamo, which is a must-see. And uh, the Menger uh, Hotel, which is where Teddy Roosevelt formed the Rough Riders, you could walk through there and in essence, it's like a museum now. Okay, George. Okay, uh, kind of a uh, one-off for us was uh, going down to uh, 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 Woodrow Wilson's birthplace down in Stanton, Virginia. Uh, interestingly, uh, you're literally not that far from Charlottesville. So if you had decided you wanna go through the Shenandoah Valley to see uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson's house and museum. You could do that. And then on your way to uh, Charlottesville and see Monticello. Uh, really uh, quite interesting. The museum was interesting. The, uh, the, the mansion as they call it, uh, where he lived. Uh, you get to see uh, uh, where he lived and a lot of the uh, original furniture that was there. But uh, museum, they have his, uh, 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 I can't think of it, uh, Pierce Arrow, uh, which was when he was president, uh, the, his desk when he was the, uh, the governor of uh, New Jersey. And uh, this was his, uh, this was his desk as, um, uh, I, I, now I'm, my mind is going blank. But anyway, it's, uh, it's worth your trip. It's a, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting museum, not, not huge, but uh, kind of worth a, a trip, especially the Shenandoah Valley, which is absolutely gorgeous. By the way, we found it interesting for like 35 years, I was, uh, when I would teach about Woodrow Wilson, I would talk about Staunton, Virginia, and you can see how it's spelled, that's spelled correctly. I learned that there, it's actually called Stanton, Virginia. Right. No idea why. Go ahead, George. Um, if you're ever at Gettysburg, we, you know, we've all toured that, or many of us toured that. Eisenhower, when he was a young artillery officer in World War I, resided there, and he only swore he would go back there. So you could visit, it borders, it's budded to, uh, you know, the Gettysburg National Park, and it's still set up as if Ike was living there. George was telling in a music and historic anecdote to our friend Joey, who decided uh, to take a little nap during it. Go ahead. Go ahead, George. We're not going to talk about Facebook. Okay. Uh, and then uh, in New York City, I think it's uh, like Broadway and uh, 18th Street. Uh, you have a, this is uh, not the original, but it's a facsimile of uh, Teddy Roosevelt's New York City home. If you get a chance, it's, it's, uh, you can take a tour of it. Uh, it's kind of worth seeing what it was like when he was he was a young man. This is a highlight. If you like Indian food and history, you could go outside the home of Chester A. Arthur. And uh, since the problem is, and by the way, it's the only standing home of a president inaugurated or sworn in in New York. Uh, the problem is since 1944, it's been a Indian deli and grocery store. But if you like curry and you like learning about Chester A. Arthur, it's quite a hot spot on Lexington Avenue. Go ahead, George. We're going to go through this real quick. We went out to Ohio and we saw about four presidents there. Um, Ohio has the most presidents since, um, except for Virginia, and many of the homes they're eight, eight, mid to late 1800 uh, presidents. So many of their homes are Victorian style. Rutherford B. Hayes, a uh, 33 room home. And actually when he died, they were debating what to do uh, with the home and uh, his belongings. And th so they started the first presidential library started at Rutherford B. Hayes. Go ahead, George, because we got to move along. 
Uh, this is uh, the Warren Harding's uh, home in Marion, Ohio. Uh, Jeff, why don't you tell the story about when we went there? Well, much to our chagrin, we didn't want to make a trip back. And we, so we go out there, the home is closed for renovations. So I said to George, let's see if we could get in. He's like, Jeff, we can't get in. I'm like, let's try. So we go to the front door and uh, we meet a guy there. And I tell him, and this really impressed him. Seriously, I was vice president of the Ocean County Historical Society. And we wanted to see your house. We're planning on doing some uh, preservation work. And my friend George actually is in the... Um, glass etching sales business, which is very successful and that's what he does. So we go there and we got to meet the chief architect curator for the state of Ohio. And we got a personal tour of Warren Gamal Harding's home. We believe we might be the first two people to see it since the renovation. George? And uh, this is this is actually the director uh, that Jeffrey's talking to right there. And he uh, Warren during his presidential uh, 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 when he was uh, running for president uh, actually understood the media pretty well. So he actually had a media center built in the back in the back in his backyard uh, to handle the newspaper men and and uh, the like that would show up to uh, to cover him. Uh, and then uh, uh, on the same trip, uh, we went to Canton, Ohio, which is where M William McKinley is uh, uh, is from. Uh, no home, his home was actually uh, torn down. So basically, you have a, uh, a mausoleum a monument uh, with his with with his mausoleum there. You can see uh, the only thing really left from his home are. Uh, some uh, in a in, in this science museum that they have there is a couch and some rugs and a desk. Other than that, there's not too much not too much left from uh, from Bill McKinley. Uh, he, he, that you can go into uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, the Mrs. McKinley. He actually lived in his wife's uh, uh, parents' home for quite a while. Uh, and this is the uh, actually the hotel that Jeffrey and I uh, stayed at, which is right across the street from that. It's called the McKinley Grand. And we think that the last time they cleaned at the McKinley Grand was when McKinley was uh, alive. So my recommendation would be don't stay at the McKinley Grand. First time ever we checked out, we were supposed to say two nights. We stayed one night. We felt like coal miners breathing in the <laughs> gosh darn dust there. Okay, George. And then you have to, while you're in Canton, if you're, well, you know what, even if you're a football fan or not, uh, it's really kind of a fascinating place. Stop at the Pro, Fo Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton. It's, uh, it's, really, uh, it's really something to see. That's George, by the way, that's not a football Hall of Famer. Go right, ahead. Right. Yep. And this is, uh, this is the hall where, where all the uh, Hall of Fame Plus. busts are. Really, even that is just interesting to see. J uh, James Garfield, who was um, assassinated on his, uh, at the train station in Washington on his way family vacation to Maine. And they actually brought him to New Jersey to recuperate because of New Jersey's fresh air. Uh, he died in a long, uh, in about three months, he died a very painful death in Elberon, which is right by Long Branch. You could see it's another Victorian style house and it was very, very nice. Okay, uh, George, next one. All right, here's the highlight. Um, former student of mine, very intelligent young lady, Lacey Higley, and we're almost done, guys, got a job with the Obama administration. And behind me is the executive office building, which used to be the War Department until World War II, where they moved to the Pentagon. Her office there was, her job responsibility was she headed up a group who when letters came in to President Obama, she would uh, disseminate where they would be headed, uh, whether Secret Service, Treasury, military. And she's been written up in a number of books and magazines because Lacey, much to her credit, um, President Obama would request 10 letters a day just from average people to be sent to him. And uh, he would read them just to get a pulse of America. She sent him the letter making him aware of Flint, Michigan and the water crisis there. So when she heard what we were doing, she arranged a private tour for us 
of the West Wing, um, which is usually closed to the public, and we didn't know what to expect. We assumed we'd be there with a group. Uh, we went through the Secret Service clearance, and one of the most surreal experiences of our life was the tour consisted of Lacey, George, and myself. So we're roaming around at night, the West Wing, totally by ourselves. Um, we sat in the press room, which is actually very small, where Wolf Blitzer has a seat. Uh, we were not allowed to go into the Situation Room. That's where you see the iconic uh, photos of uh, when Barack Obama decided they were going to kill um, Osama bin Laden. They have a 24-hour mess there for the president run by the captain, by the, I'm sorry, by the Navy. George wanted a cheeseburger, would not do it. Um, we, we, oh, we got to go up to the Oval Office and there's a rail there. We couldn't get into it, but we're staring into it. And what an experience that was. You're thinking of all the decisions that made there. And there was a young Secret Service uniformed agent, female sitting outside there. And she was just a delight. There was nobody else around. Um, so we were talking with her. She probably thought we were the biggest bunch of nerds. We were doing presidential trivia with her. But that was the experience of a lifetime. George? Yeah. Then we also went to see the Washington Nationals. They had this funny thing before the games, they have these facsimiles of presidents run around. So um, we didn't select Lincoln or Jefferson. We wanted Taft because we feared he'd make us look skinny. Um, we think the races are fixed because he actually wins them sometimes, but that's where the Washington Nationals play. All right, George. And we also, uh, besides the West Wing, we, we wanted to kind of see uh, the the other wing. So we went to see the East Wing and and, it's it, if you get a chance uh, once they open it up. I'm, I'm I don't know whether they closed it, but once it's open again, uh, uh, it's really worth seeing. You, you have the East Room and the 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 hallway, main hallway, uh, the green room there. Uh, this is a picture from the blue room out. You see, you can see the Washington Monument in the background. This is the. Uh, 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 formal dining area, but it, it, it is such a fascinating place. If you get a chance, uh, make sure you make sure you, uh, you can get a ticket from your Senator or Congressman yeah. and get, get in to see it. Yeah. All right. Two, uh, we have two more to go. This is our last sojourn. I guess it was two years ago. Uh, yeah. George, tell them everything exciting to yeah. do in Abilene, Kansas. Say something. Okay. Uh, well, that'll take over. You want to come in? Excuse me. Go ahead, George. Okay, um, uh, Abilene is uh, is is uh, not a hop in town. Uh, probably the neatest thing to go to when you're in Abilene is the Eisenhower uh, complex. Uh, you have Eisenhower's boyhood home. Uh, there is a museum. They uh, unfortunately, when we were there, they were renovating it, so we we did get to see items, but not uh, not not as much as probably when it was uh, completely open. Uh, but it is it is worth it. Uh, like I said, Abilene is not the, the most hoppinest town. Uh, you can go and see the largest uh, 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 boot spur in the world, or get uh, uh, all you can eat chicken at Brookville at the Brookville Hotel as long as it's only a quarter of a chicken. Yeah, they told us we had all we could eat. They're out of business, by the way. No. All right, on uh, the way back. Yeah, and then we, we uh, hit Fort Riley, Kansas, which is where uh, the 7th Cavalry is and George Custer's headquarters, and then on to, on to Independence, Missouri with Truman. And this is the last one. Interestingly, um, Truman was still alive when this museum opened, and he would, had a short walk from his house. He would go there every single day, and he would just greet people randomly, talk to scroll groups, things like that. Uh, that was prior to when you had Secret Service protection. He had one policeman walk with them. Great museum. You could spend a good three, four hours there. There's the Oval Office. When you enter, that's the, like the signature painting of Manifest Destiny and all it involves, which was basically saying America has a God-given right to expand from coast to coast. But uh, that's symbolic of it because Missouri was a gateway uh, to the West. Uh, 1948, you see that train to the left. A um, hundred magazines predicted that Truman was going to lose the 48 election to Thomas Dewey. He says he's going to bring it up. 
uh, to the people, travels across the country. And that's where the slogan, give them hell, Harry begins. And there's a famous picture of him on that train holding up uh, the newspaper of the day after the election, Dewey defeats Truman. Other things, Kansas City, by the way, was a great city, great to visit, great food. The buck stops here, okay. Uh, he was a captain in World War I, elected by his own men. George? George? Then you walk a short distance to the historical district. That's his house. Our tour guide literally lived two houses down across the street. That was um, Bess Wallace's, his wife's mother's house. They resided there. Um, he would just, the neighbors all knew him from walking the neighborhood. In fact, if there was a newspaper out on the street, he put it on their lawn. Um, he would take his daily constitutionals. Uh, uh, Bess lived there until the 1980s. Um, he was so down to earth when the National Park Service took it over, there was 50,000, 50,000 unopened items, all sorts of presidential gifts, et cetera, that were located there. One more highlight, George. Yep. Well, believe it or not, one of the most in attended museums in the United States is the World War I Museum located in Kansas City, Missouri. That... Uh, that large monument you see where if you look at that picture that's when it was dedicated in the 1920s all the prominent world war one generals were there including black jack pershing uh you could spend easily a half day there george and i applied in advance uh to go to their research department and one of the cool things we did both our grandfathers served in world war one so we were able to research what ships they went over on we saw their birth certificates what units they were in etc mm -hmm. um yep. Uh, go ahead, George. As you can tell, we're big baseball fans. Uh, we didn't know what to expect. Uh, there is a wonderful Negro League baseball museum there, which really transcends sports. It shows you what these wonderful players had to go through who never made it to the major league, such as Satchel Page. Okay, George. Okay, we're done. Okay, uh, we hope you enjoyed it. And uh, We'll be glad if anybody has any questions about the presidents, about places we visited, about a travel recommendations, what we saw, please go right ahead. Thank you so much, Jeff and George, for your informative and engaging presentation. Um, as Jeff said, if anyone has questions, you should be able to unmute yourself and ask. Otherwise, I'd be happy to read them from the chat. Um, maybe while you are all looking for your mute buttons, I'll start by reading one that's already in the chat. Um, someone okay. asked, uh, let, well, someone commented, in case you're not reading the chat, July 4th, the Cleveland birthplace has a free ice cream social. Who doesn't love free ice cream? Right. Um, our friends from the Somerset County Historical Association ask, um, and let's see, this is a good trivia question for our speaker. Uh -oh. Wasn't Calvin Coolidge born in Vermont? He was, and he was also the only president born on the 4th of July. Oh. Yes. Very interesting. Okay, yep. any other? Uh, I see Barbara raising a hand. Go ahead, Barbara Dawson. Hi, I just wanted to say that our son lives in Charlottesville, Virginia. Oh. We have been to Monticello uh, quite a few times, and every time we go, yeah. it happens to have a different docent, and we hear different stories. Uh -huh. So if you've just been to Monticello once or twice, keep going back, yes. just learn more and more. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and Great it, presentation, it, Jeffrey. Oh, thank you, and we appreciate that, what you just said about keeping the visit. It, um, it's on an 820-foot cliff or mountain, and it's just awe-inspiring when you first saw it. And your, your son, by the way, lives in a wonderful, wonderful community. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, anybody else? Any other questions? Uh, Jeff and George, just so you're aware, if you're not seeing the chat, it is full of praise for your wonderful presentation. Oh. Oh, that's <laughs> great. That's great. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you again to our speakers, Jeff and George. Thank you again to Barbara, Mickey, and Richard for organizing today's event. Um, remember that if any of you missed the beginning or if you want to share this with your friends, the video will be posted to YouTube. And remember to register for next week's presentation 
also online, also free uh, with Congressman Andy Kim. So with that, everyone stay safe, enjoy the snow, and uh, we hope to see you soon. Melissa, Bye -bye. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.